Yes, so this is a joint work, a paper that we put out uh, years ago, and another one is due to come out very soon. In fact, it's already have come out, but it hasn't yet for various reasons. Okay. What follows, I should stress, is mostly experimental mathematics. We can prove one or two things here, not from the actual data. Um, and David assures me that everyone here knows what a seek is, and that I don't spend any time explaining, so I won't. I just thought I'd... of this kind have been constructed numerically for all dimensions up to 121 and for a handful of other dimensions up Finally, the seeks in dimensions three have some special properties. And 
I'm just going to ignore talking about the actual numbers, that is, the, well, it's not, I, I could say the components of the vectors, um, but of course there's an ambiguity then. If you depend on the base, and because we're talking about complex vectors, they also depend on the overall complex phase, multiplying them. And that can make a huge difference to the number field. You can make by multiplying the appropriate phase. So we want to get rid of that arbitrariness in the phase. I'll always be talking about the projector. Obviously, if you turn the projector onto that vector, something is the usual basis in which the Weyl Heisenberg displacement operators have the usual form. Okay. Now, let me just be concrete about what those numbers are. Um, okay, that's of one component of the seat projector in the main And you can see it's a fairly disgusting object. At least it is to all appearances. Um, So the text file containing the and you know, it takes a long time just to read it in to the computer program. It's a complex field, and I'm going to be saying a lot about the field. The field is the subject of this talk. It's always a finite degree out number field. number, <coughs> because that's actually how it works. And a colleague of mine told me, you know, when he called the day to work, he really realized what sort of numbers you get. And then he decided any problem that produces numbers as revolting as that can't possibly be interesting. And I want to convince you that's the wrong way around. It's interesting exactly because it's generating these ostensibly horrible numbers, not as horrible as they look, not as horrible. I hope to convince you that this is kind of stands in the world of numbers, rather as the Taj Mahal stands for the world of architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not really implausible. So this is dimension 11. So if I were to, any um, root unity that be written out, indeed, and you'd look at this and you'd say it's horrible. But in fact, it wouldn't be horrible. It'd be a very special number. What I'm going to say is that number, in fact, is a very special number. 
it just doesn't look that way. So there are 62 known examples of things. Um, and the first thing that you notice about them, a little while to notice this, is to calculate a non-trivial example of an example as Marcus Pressel. And I looked at his expression way back in 2006 or when it was, and I thought, why on earth did he bother? But then it occurred to me rather relatedly that he very because it's expressible in radicals, that is, combination. Why is that surprising? Well, there's a famous theorem of Galois that says that if you've got a polynomial equation of degree 5 or bigger, the solution is simply not expressible in radicals. But the generic case is not expressible in radicals. If you polynomial equation. It, it, it's a polynomial in the real and imaginary part of the time. Not in Psi itself. We find in Psi for the real and imaginary major major process actually, as will become apparent. Polynomial um, equations in the components of Psi. And you might say, okay, if we're four, that's okay. Four is less than five. However, there are polynomial equations in many variables. Standard way of equations is the Grobner basis, which is a sort of analog for multivariable polynomial equations of the row echelon instead of linear equations. What that degree four polynomial equations in many variables? You turn that solving that into the problem of solving a series of polynomials in one variable only. You vastly increase the coefficients. They get absolutely diabolical. Um, that's the standard work. Well, it used to be the standard So the point is, you're actually they're actually coming out of polynomials solutions of very high degree polynomials. I think it's up to degree 100 or something. So it's something unexpected that the solution ends up as radicals. You know the solutions are going to be radical algebraic numbers, but it's tells there's something surprising about them being radicals. The Galois group must be what is technically called a solvable group. Okay, so I just want to say a little bit about Galois theory for the benefit of people who don't know about it. Um, there's one example of a Galois group that I think it's fair to say everybody knows. Um, just consider the way we construct the complex numbers over the reals. Reals, which are a number field. I, can I assume everyone's familiar with what a number field is? It, it, it's basically just a set of numbers that are closed under the usual arithmetic operations. And then you, a Galois conjugation is a field automorphism, that is a structure preserving map. It's the analog for fields of linear maps for vector spaces. So the operation And in the case, this case, there's a super, there's the identical complex conjugation. And those two maps together form the Galois group, which in this case is very boring. It's just a order to cycle. So the general way of a finite degree uh, number I take the field. In the previous example, it's the real operator, which was I in the previous example. Then you take the small field and the generator. Um, and assuming that I've said something A and something to you, sorry. You are 
and A are supposed to be the same thing here. Um, as generated is an algebraic number that is the root of a polynomial with a The B view, the deal generated, consists of all combinations of that form with the coefficient in the base field. And again, it's the degree of the polynomial having U as U as a root. Um, it's also called the degree of the solution. And the Gauss group consists of all the map taking extension field to itself, which is the base field, and presents a group order less than or equal to the degree. And we're mainly interested in the case where the extension is equal, where the order is equal to the degree, it's said to be a normal extension or some other. over the real number. Um, your base field would be the rational, and you add the single additional generator root 2, and the field consists of all combinations like that. And again, in this case, you'll find the Galois group is extremely simple, there's the identity and the analog of complex conjugation, which just flips the sign of root 2. So again, the Galois group is cyclic for 2. Um, slightly, actually a rather important example, um, is what's called cyclic, <coughs> which are fields generated by roots of of So let, it's easier to structure is simplest if the uh, it's you can see where P is a prime number and then the field all combinations of that form where the C's and rational numbers and only the unity and the Galois group P minus one order morphisms that take omega omega to the K is any integer between one and P minus one. The Galois group is psi P minus 1. Um, if we take root of unity where it's not a prime number, um, it, we're still talking about an abelian Galois group, but it's no longer cyclic. Um, <coughs> um, because if you take, for example, cube roots of the basic equation is omega cubed equals 1, but that factorizes omega minus 1 into 1 plus omega plus omega squared to the minimum. Um, now, you can also do this operation of adding a generator and taking the field, smallest field containing Place by a single u. Well, okay, v. Written v. Um, but in many cases, it's actually convenient to think in terms of the tower because the tower often brings out structure apparent with the single generator. As um, okay, so I gave two examples of a Galois group which were abelian. So we first of all extend by including I, um, so we put the complex number because we're extending the rational by adding in I instead of this. And then we extend the game and then it's fairly easy to satisfy. This Gower group is created by these two Gower organisms. Uh, that's basically just complex conjugation. This is complex conjugation. It's just that it's basically sending root to the minus root. Things on the end. And it's basically the operation to the cube. So you have that relationship. So that's a fairly simple example of a non-Arbelian Galois group. However, if 
you look, go back to the tower, there's a group of all automorphisms of that fix Q. Ask yourself, okay, what about the group of the individual extensions? And then it's fairly easy to see. an arbitrary field E, it's generated by radical, if and only if it can be constructed with power like the four, meaning the degree of the extension of the as the order of the group. And group of each four is abelian, exactly what we saw in the previous example. That's both necessary by radical. Um, and you can break the main theorem establishes a correspondence between groups and fields. So you consider all the subfields of a given field, and you can establish a correspondence between those and the subgroups, normal subgroups of the main Galois. So as a statement of the Galois group, and then he used that to prove the famous theorem that polynomials and I don't think that. <coughs> it's not relevant. If we go back to seeks, we know from calculating 62 different examples that they seem always to be expressible in random. There are multiple ways of doing this, I should say. There isn't a unique tower. Um, so what I'm really talking about is... And this is the so there's many ways of doing it. But the shortest tower is height 2. And I think by far the shortest way of writing it is like that. And the thing to notice is height... If it, assuming the Galois group isn't actually our B, that's as short as it can be. And the other thing is, is degree 2. It's simply a quadratic field generated by a square root. And that's as low as the degree can be, consistent with the whole field not being, in fact, an Arbelian extension. The fact that an generator of the degree 2 basis, the first it's always seems that it's the square free part of that number. In other words, you divide out all, when I say square free part, I mean you divide out all the squares. So, for instance, if it was 12, you divide out a 4, and you'd be left with 3. 3 is the square free part. I have no idea why this is observation. Case. Okay. So that's all. A lot simpler than one had any right to expect. It gets because E isn't just any Arbelian extension of Q of root D. It's 
it's a very, very special one. Extremely. Um, <coughs> so I want to go back now to Abelian extensions in general. Um, and then, because when you're all work for the past hundred But, but, but actually, it's, 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 it's been the sort of main focus of a significant part of pure mathematics for a long time. Um, and in um, quite a lot known about them as a result of all the effort, though not as much as we'd like to. It starts with was sort of finally brought to a conclusion by Weber. And Christopher asked himself, okay, what is the general form of an Abelian extension of the rational? What's the most It's a beautiful result. Um, and Kroeger was very happy about this. And he thought, OK, the sky's the limit. I'm going to do everything now. So the next thing he turned to was, I'll be the general question. We've got some base field K, and we want to characterize the other. to do it, again, with some help by some other people. not only the most beautiful theory, theory part of mathematics, but the beautiful in the whole a bit of a stop, but actually quoted in his obituary in Nature in 1943 by, and the obituary writer claims to have heard him say it herself in the lecture. Anyway, whether it, perhaps he was just feeling be excited that day. It does seem slightly excessive to me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it definitely impressed him enough to make this the focus of his 12th problem. And the 12th problem just asks to generalize the theory of complex multiplication of another field. Um, and the obvious place to start is real quadratic fields, uh, which is where people duly have started for the past 100 years. Now, for real quadratic the first thing you need to do is identify the analogues of these fields, the analogues of the cyclotomic fields, the fields which are in, some, in a certain special sense in maximum. I'm not going to explain what that sense is. So the So the point is, if you've got a number of fields, there's absolutely many ways of choosing the generator. There's a lot of ways of choosing the generator of that field. But this 
this is a very special choice of generator. It's got the particularly nice special value of a value It's also got really nice features, so you must, you know, you know, then, then it's nice. It's which feature in the theory of complex multiplication as applied to imaginary quadratic fields. And basically, it's the, it's the second bit of the problem that's unsolved. The first bit has been solved. So these, I guess it, it should be identified. The analogs of the cyclotronic field are now, and they, they can be specified. Um, they're technically called ray class fields, and the analog of n is called the conductor. Um, and the cyclotronic fields themselves are fields. <coughs> um, there are four fields in the case of a real quadratic field. of this special generator. I'm going to argue that the special generator may actually be Seco. <coughs> um, anyway, there are algorithms for calculating ray class fields, and they're actually quite fast, often, not always. So you just go to a program like We've actually got every vial height increased in dimension from 4 to 50. And in those cases, you always, the number of distinct Clifford orbits is one of the So it's a small number. In all these cases, when you actually look at the exact solution, that the, there's one orbit, the number of it generates has no degree. And they, they, you just by adding a single additional generator, and it's just the square root of a prime number. Um, so there is basically a, a, a sort of canonical field here, which I'll call the minimal field, um, <coughs> and it turns out always the ray class field over that real quadratic field with conducted. So it's, it's actually, the seek is actually generating this very special field, the analog of a cyclotomic field. Um, so this raises two natural questions. The first is just how many ray class fields do you get this way from the seek? Well, I'm putting it, you might maybe a one for each dimension. Knowing the field doesn't really maybe tell you very much about the geometric structure. Certainly be the case with MUBs, for instance, mutually unbiased spaces, which in fact generate a cyclotomic field. And knowing that is absolutely no help at all. What is calculated? Um, so is that the same here? And we work backwards in some way from the field of geometry. I'm going to say a very cautious sort of me yes to that last question. Um, it tells you a lot more than you'd expect. Well, I would expect it anyway. Starting with the first question <coughs> How many rest are fields? Suppose we, instead of starting with a seek and ask for the ray class field, so let's 
and we say, OK, here's a real quadratic field, Q of root M. Can I find a dimension D such that and, and, and the conductor M? I've got a ray class bit that's giving me that ray class field. Given M, there's infinitely an infinite sequence of dimensions and therefore conductors. The conductor is the same as the formula in terms of the Chebyshev polynomial. You need to know the first dimension in the sequence, and that is not is less straightforward. There isn't a simple formula for it. There is an so um, but what it's basically giving you is for each real quadratic field giving you an infinite set of ray class fields. They're not giving you them all, however. So they give you infinitely many isn't bad. It's quite a lot less than everything in this case. Um, let's go into question two. Suppose we take the sequence that starts at dimension four. dimension is a divisor of the next. In fact, there are infinitely many such subsequences. Um, you notice those two intersect at four, but after that they're distinct. Um, now, why is that interesting? Well, if you go back to cyclotomic field, if this conductor, this conductor the first field is easily seen So when the conductors divide, the fields embed. And that was the general feature. So that immediately raises the question, if those fields are embedding, are the states themselves embedding in that way? And the answer is yes, actually, um, in a very strange way. Um, I don't know, we don't know this one very well. They definitely are embedding. Um, so that is the prospect that you might manage to get an inductive proof for seek existence. You, 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 you calculate a seek in dimension 4, and then you just go all the way up the tower, zoom. Um, that's a sort of little dream. But, but it's not totally based on nothing. <coughs> the, the embedding is definitely there. If one understood the way it's working better, one might be able to do that. So. Going back to that question, does knowing the field tell you anything about the seek? Well, it certainly doesn't tell you. It gives you a useful clue. Okay, uh, what, five more minutes, please? Oh, ten. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> well, okay, one more thing um, is to do with what is called the unit group. I better explain what that is. So for this, I need to just introduce the idea of algebraic integers, as they're called. Um, algebraic number theory is confusingly some integers. You what the normal people call integers, they call rational integers. But anyway, we'll call them algebraic integers. Um, um, so the point is, if you take the rational numbers, you can give any rational number as a ratio of two ordinary integers. You can do this with an arbitrary algebraic number field. You can define a set of algebraic integers which play the same role for that number field that the ordinary integers do for the rational numbers. And in fact, algebraic number theory is so cool, it's actually the algebraic integers that it's all about. So ordinary number theory is about the properties of ordinary integers, algebraic number theory is about the properties of algebraic integers. And it's big with For example, there's an analog of the prime factorization theorem. So with ordinary integers, an arbitrary integer has a unique factorization into primes. And the same sort of thing works here. He's playing a big role in the theory of ray class fields. So for instance, if you want to know what that con word conductor means, you need to go very quickly into the theory of algebraic integers. But there's a special feature, 
Namely, um, if you talk about the ordinary integers, for almost all n, 1 over n isn't an integer. That only fails if n is plus or minus 1. There's only exactly two ordinary integers whose inverse, multiplicative inverse, is also an integer. If you're talking about a general algebraic number field, that's no longer true. It's usually an infinite set of algebraic integers whose inverses are also algebraic integers. So the case of two root two, it's every integer of that one can be plus or minus. And the set of such numbers are called units. Those, those such numbers are called units. So if you multiply two of them together, you get another unit. So they a group, the unit group, which is an object of considerable interest to this subject. Um, now, suppose we're talking about a C. Here's the in every case. Um, I think it has, and they also actually determine the seat. If you know those phases, you know the seat. So you can throw away the projector and focus on those phases. And I tend to think maybe that's what you should do. The thing of main interest here is the phases from a number of point of view. Um, <coughs> suppose you take generated by the overlap phases. So that's I must my You can the unit all the phases. And then you ask how these two are related. The problem here is that it is formidably difficult to calculate a unit group. Um, sum, the seek phase group, and another group of the Anyway, they're, they're sort of really special. It's a surprising fact that the seat is a simple expression in terms. 
terms of those generators. In fact, they often are the generators. Um, so that's something you actually not just are. And, yeah, it's increased the speculation that just conceivably they could be these magic numbers, in fact. Um, okay. So finally coming back to Hilbert's 12th problem, I mean, it certainly occurred to me, I can imagine it must have occurred to any number about uh, function identities. Just find the right numbers and use them identity. interest to that idea because if you could do that, if you could express the space in terms of elliptic functions or theta functions or something like those lines, wouldn't actually have solved the problem because the things aren't giving you the full class of ray class set of ray class theory. But I think in saying to the algebraic number theorists at that point you get very is generating the ray class field. So you take the numbers you get from the seek, generate the they generate them. Um, this is all done on the computer, so you can calculate the number field. You then take the generators for a ray class field. There's an algorithm for constructing the ray class field. You check that the generators for the ray class field are in the field generated for the seek. You also check that the generators of the seek field are in the ray class field. Then um, so that's how you check the statement about the ray class field. Uh, regarding the unit group, you calculate the unit group. You, it's easy to, this is easy to check. coefficient and the last coefficient being one. So the, it's calculating the minimal polynomial of each of the phases, and you can check that it has the required property. And then you calculate the unit group, you pick out where the units are phases, you pick generators, and you do Yes, you use a computer. Yes, yes. I, it's, it's all done. So. Yes. Um, it goes by the Galois theory. Um, it's going to be a paper. Um, so the point is that if you know that the base field is Q of root D. You, if, you've got, if you've given a um, floating point number and you're told it's of the form N plus M root 2, you can actually work out what N and M are. Um, and if N and M aren't too difficult, you could just do it by sort of brute force search. But there's actually something called the LL algorithm or PSQL algorithm, which is a very efficient way of finding N and M. Um, and that will work for more complicated things, n plus m root 2 plus r root 3 or whatever. The trouble with these things is the fields are extremely high degree, like degree 1,000. And the more complicated the number is, the higher the precision. So to do a brute force calculation for these using 
PSQL algorithm would require a degree of precision of, say, a million or more, and it's not really possible. Um, but what you can do is you know the Galois symmetries. <coughs> no, you think you know them. You conjecturally know them. You also, um, the symmetry doesn't fit here. So one knows actually how, conjecturally knows how the Galois permutes the overlap phases. So you take a bunch of phases which are on form a single Galois order, and you form the polynomial having them as roots, and then the coefficients of that polynomial are forced down into the base field. And so you can then find the coefficients using PSQL, and then you've now got an exact polynomial, and you then factor. I thought I quite I agree. I'm That, that, yes, absolutely. Of course, if you're interested in the number theory side of it, it, it that <laughs> not probably give you something interesting. But I have wondered if there are, I think there will be other ways of relaxing it, not just randomly, um, in such a way that you get a bigger number field. And I've actually, I've been thinking of trying some ideas along those lines. Ha, ha, ha. 